Greetings. I'm Rajiv Gulati, Interventional Cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and today we'll be discussing what's new in bare metal and drug eluting stents. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Guri Sandhu, Director of the Cath Lab at Mayo, and Dr. Malcolm Bell, Director of the Ischemic Heart Disease Program. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Malcolm, maybe I can start with you. Uh, why don't we start with Norstent? Uh, tell us what basically the study was and the headline findings. Well, Norstent, uh, as we, we all know, was just recently uh, presented and then published just, just in the last few weeks. I think it's important, though, that we understand the historical context of this uh, trial. Remembering the drug eluting stents were developed to overcome the failings of bare metal stents over, over many years. Early on, there was a concern about uh, an added risk, though, with drug eluting stents, even though they reduced restenosis uh, because of the issue of stent thrombosis. First generation stents. First generation yeah. drug eluting stents. So we're talking about the Cypher and the Taxa stents in particular. And then over time, with second generation drug eluting stents, it became apparent from a number of meta-analyses that perhaps these stents were actually safer than bare metal stents. But it's not really clear that that message was really heard by everyone in, in the field. But certainly recent guidelines have suggested that drug eluting stents are superior to drug, uh, bare metal stents and that that safety issue is no longer uh, important. Some of those analyses actually suggested that there was a decrease in MI and mortality with drug eluting stents, even with though they've the, never the been tested stents, with the yeah. current uh, drug eluting stents. And that's always been a little difficult to, to fathom out. So that was the background, and the, the North stent was a large, really well-conducted Norwegian study. They enrolled probably 60% or more of all of the PCI uh, procedures that were done in Norway between about 2008, 2011. And they randomized them to bare metal stents and drug eluting stents, and they took all comers. So that's really important because that uh, reflects our current practice. And using stents that we're using today. Mm -hmm. So a very, very important study, and I think they need to be congratulated for that. But that was a randomized study performed in every uh, stent center in Norway. It's the largest bare metal stent versus drug eluting stent uh, study ever performed, uh, over 9,000 patients. And getting back to your original question, the headline news was that the primary endpoint, and this is important to everyone you know, to understand, was MI and mortality. And it showed that these were equivalent. Now, some people would be surprised by that, but we really shouldn't be because we've never shown that stents have improved survival and why would it necessarily decrease uh, MI, but particularly the survival question. So I think that was very clear from, from this study. However, the secondary endpoints were target vessel revascularization and stent thrombosis. And it was very clear that drug eluting stents were superior in both of those uh, endpoints compared to bare metal stents. And so it really showed that drug eluting stents, second generation stents, uh, are, doing, are performing better than bare metal stents. And in particular, the stent thrombosis was uh, reduced and revascularization was re reduced, which is exactly why these stents were developed in the first place. So I think this is really good news for, uh, for all of us who are using the second generation drug eluting stents. Very good. Good. If I can yeah. turn to you, uh, I mean, that, so the primary endpoint was neutral, was negative, but the yeah. rates of TLR lower with a second generation drug eluting stents. Clinically meaningful, economically meaningful? Uh, I comments? think this is clinically meaningful because, um, as you know, the differences were 5% TLR for the drug eluting stents. That's the absolute reduction. Yep, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, versus 10% for the bare metal. So okay. that is a substantial difference and pretty much goes in line with what we know about drug eluting stents and why they were designed. Similarly, as Malcolm mentioned, the stent thrombosis rates were about 0.8% for the drug eluting stents versus 1.2% for the bare metal. So both were equally good, but very nice reassuring results overall. Let me ask you one more uh, thing on this study, Malcolm. The diabetics were underrepresented. Yeah. So uh, as I said, it was all comers. Um, and there were very few exclusion criteria, so uh, you know, if you had a prior stent, you weren't allowed to be in the study. And there were a few other things there that would you know, make sense. And 
you know, and, and the, the typical breakdown, STEMI, non-STEMI, unstable angina, stable angina. But the diabetics, it's interesting, uh, um, it was about 12% of the population in this study had diabetes, which is at least half of what we typically see in these stent uh, trials. So I think we just have to be a little uh, careful with our interpretation, there, although there was no signal that, that these were doing, one was doing significantly better uh, in one versus the other. But you think they were underrepresented because they weren't randomized? The clinicians had concern about randomizing diabetics to uh, bare metal stents? I don't think so. That, didn't, okay. uh, that wasn't really apparent uh, to me. The other thing, too, is that this was a relatively younger age group. So as I said, you know, it enrolled a lot of uh, people uh, having stent procedures in Norway during that time. Uh, and yet the median age was a little lower than what we might uh, you know, typically uh, see. But the diabetic, uh, your question is important because as we know, drug eluting stents, at least with the first generation of your studies, did seem to perform much better in diabetics uh, compared to bare metal stents. And there's one other thing, you know, I think that you know, maybe this will come out and Guru can make some comments on this as well, but uh, is that drug eluting stents were introduced about 13 years or so ago. And we, we tend to you know, keep comparing drug eluting stents that we're currently using to the old bare metal stents. But we have to remember bare metal stent technology has improved as well. Yep. So these bare metal stents were really, as we say about the second generation drug eluting stents, not your grandfather's bare metal stents. So these, these are you know, different alloys, thinner struts. And in fact, many people may be surprised at how well bare metal stents actually did in this study, but yet drug eluting stents still outperformed them with respect to the secondary endpoint. Very good. Yeah. The stent thrombosis rate, though, was statistically significantly lower with the drug eluting stents, right. which I think uh, uh, really um, solidifies what we've learned from some of the meta-analyses. Fascinating findings. Any thoughts, Guri, as to why the current generation DS may, may have lower late stent thrombosis rates than the uh, bare metal stents? Yeah, I think there are basically several improvements that have happened over the years. The first improvement we've seen is the strut thickness. So the original cipher stents had pretty thick struts. There was also some risk of the polymer fracturing and uh, causing stent thrombosis. So that has pretty much gone away. And the current generation drug eluting stents and bare metal stents, like Malcolm said, are a completely different platform. Lower profile, thinner struts, and even the quality of the polymers is better. Now, now with regards to the stent thrombosis, it's maybe worth pointing out that in the North stent study, both the bare metal and drug eluting stent groups received nine months of, right. yeah. of a, a dual antiplatelet therapy. You know, when we when we think about bare metal stent utilization in the U.S., it's typically to to abbreviate the duration of antiplatelet therapy. Any comments on on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point to bring up. I think we have to be very very cautious in our recommendation of uh, shortening the, the dual antiplatelet therapy for bare metal stents, with the belief that we're going to reduce. Um, the rate of any event if we put a bare metal stent in versus a drug eluting stent. So you're absolutely right, nine months of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. So I think that we have to be very, very careful in extrapolating this to say that we could put a bare metal stent in and just given a, a very abbreviated uh, course of dual antiplatelet therapy. And again, I think the point of this uh, study that is really important for us to remember for the finding is that this stent thrombosis rate, and it was actually very low in both groups. Right. So right, I think that underlines the point groups. that the technology yeah. has changed mm -hmm. significantly for, for both stents. And again, survival wasn't any different. But I think that, uh, and certainly based on the meta-analyses uh, prior to this study, um, I, I think there was a warning there that uh, we, we shouldn't underestimate you know, the, the benefit of putting a drug eluting stent, and that there probably isn't that upfront risk of stent thrombosis exceeding what it would be for a bare metal stent, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that that's very helpful. It does make sense. So any role for bare metal stent in your practice nowadays uh, with the North Stent study? Uh, w which patients might you expect to use bare metal stents in? I, th I think in general, I, most patients should be considered for, for drug eluting stents. I think North Stent really shows us that there's no mm -hmm. downside to putting a drug eluting stent in. And furthermore, you know, we've had uh, recent uh, data and guidelines supporting shorter duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, you know, three, six months, particularly, you know, for patients with stable uh, angina. But the patients who you might consider bare metal stent, I mean, if cost was an issue, that's not usually an issue in, in this country, 
a very big <laughs> vessel uh, where we may need to put like a five millimeter um, you know, bare metal stand. And the incidence of recent osteoarthritis there is, is very, very low. I think the question of the, the patient who's at risk of bleeding is still open. And, and as you pointed out, bare metal stents in this study still were accompanied by nine months of dual antiplatelet therapy. So we don't know whether in this type of population with these stents, whether each stent would perform the same, particularly in terms of safety, with shortened dual antiplatelet therapy. Well, that's a nice transition. Perhaps we can move on to another study, the, the patients with high bleeding risk and possible potential yeah. to reduce uh, DAPT duration. Guru, do you want to comment on the Leaders Free uh, study? Give us the headline yeah. news and the design. So the Leaders Free study was basically BioLimus A9 or Urolimus versus a bare metal stent. And these received 30 days of dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, we, we don't, the, these are not FDA approved, you, utilized in the US yeah, just yet. Yeah, these are not right? available in the US. And these stents were also polymer free. So it was drug on the metal versus bare metal. And 30 days, about 1,200 patients in each arm. And the results here were fairly in line with what we know of drug eluting stents versus bare metal stents. About 5% versus 10% target uh, legionary vascularization. But there was something interesting in here. Stent thrombosis rates in both arms were about 2%. So maybe this is something, Malcolm, which you could comment on. I think it's a higher risk uh, population, and we still don't know what the minimum duration of dual antiplatelet therapy, but these are complicated patients. There's all sorts of reasons why they may have a higher risk of stent thrombosis. So these specifically were higher bleeding risk patients. They were elderly, they had, they had other risk factors. Right, you know, and they may need to have some surgery. So there's something else about these patients. So we, we know that, yes, they're a high risk of bleeding, and, and that's a problem in itself, yep. and this slightly higher risk of stent thrombosis. But it's hard to sort of tease out what, what, what comes first. Um, so we don't really know the circumstances, at least the, uh, what has been published, on what those stent thromboses uh, were. But I think, again, it tells us that you know, we, we, we don't have to necessarily put bare metal stents into these patients. The, the patients who got the drug eluting yeah. stents still did better. But is there a fine line between three months of DAPT versus pushing it down to one month for a drug eluting stent? I think that remains to be seen. Uh, I mean, it really does. Yeah. Very good. Well, we discussed nicely the North Stent trial of bare metal versus drug losing, mm -hmm. and we, we've alluded now to the Leaders Free uh, study. Why don't we move on to bioresorbable scaffolds? Okay. Know, the hot topic of the day, um, exciting promise for the future. Guru, do you want to comment on maybe some of the recent findings that were presented at TCT uh, a couple of months ago? Yeah. So at TCT, the main discussion was the three year data on the absorb stand. The absorb two trial, three years uh, uh, follow yeah, up. Three year yeah. follow up. And the one slight red flag there which raised concern was the late stent thrombosis rates with these. There were about six patients who developed late stent thrombosis out of about 300 plus patients. And um, that was concerning because in the control arm, which was the Zion struggle looting stent, there were no late stent thrombosis. Malcolm, any comments on the, uh, those findings? They've not been published yet, as far as I understand. Yeah, so it's, it's a promise, isn't it? And I think that intuitively, and all of us, and all of our patients would love to, to walk in and say, if I have a stent that dissolves away, yeah. and there's no evidence of it you know, being there in one, two, three years, that, that would be wonderful. And although these trials are meeting their primary endpoint, there is this wiring signal of uh, um, higher rates of later stent thrombosis, which, which will throw the whole duration of DAPT into confusion, I think. Uh, so we, we don't know the answer you know, to that. We, we know and just uh, we, we know that there are some issues in terms of deliverability. Uh, are we choosing the right size stents? One of the concerns, and the FDA, I mean, it's been approved in the United States. They had these data, um, and they, I mean, they don't have all of it, of course, but when it was approved, they, they had the data that still showed a signal of these later events uh, being more frequent with the bioabsorbable um, uh, vascular uh, scaffold. But it may be that these were just in the smaller vessel, so I think we have to be careful there. One thing which is really interesting, one of the promises was that this would 
maintain or at least uh, you could have vasomotor function restored where you generally don't with a bare metal stent because simply yeah. there's a bare metal stent there or, or, or a drug leading stent so a, a metal scaffold of course that vessel isn't going to vasoconstrict vasodilate and interestingly in the absorb 2 trial it showed that there wasn't a difference and that's a little uh, disappointing mm -hmm. so um, I think there are going to be a lot of challenges uh, for us and our patients trying to choose yeah. you know, who's going to uh, want to have these stents who should we put these in but uh, there's just, there to, some, to, just to counter that I mean just to get to play the devil's advocate there have been concerns or questions about methodology what we certainly learned from the earlier absorb studies that deployment matters technique matters and that has the potential yeah, to influence long-term outcomes method of assaying vasomotion there's multiple different ways and perhaps uh, as we see these uh, these data come out into the public domain we'll be able to tease out some of the nuances of the, of, of the trial and and how methodology may have impacted long-term I, I think that's true, and it you know it just goes back to those early drug eluding stent days, doesn't it? Yeah. We we just got a little lazy in terms of putting these in, that's and right. uh, and so again we we haven't used these in the United States for very long at all, so we don't have a vast experience. Been speaking to the people who have had a lot of experience, I, you know, implantation technique is going to be absolutely critical. So we, we cannot afford to get sloppy uh, with these uh, stents, but there'll be some more longer term data coming out with yeah. the Absorb 4 uh, trial, and, um, and we're all hopeful that these will be reassuring, but at the moment I think there are some worrying signals, not, not enough to say that we shouldn't just use them, you know, carte blanche to, to just make that decision. Um, I think we've got to keep an open mind here, but it, it may be, I mean, these are first generation, but I'm not sure that we're going to see second you know, generation absorbable scaffolds that are going to look very different to this at any time really soon. I mean, there may be some other um, thoughts that Guri has on other types of uh, resorbable you know, stents. I mean, we, we're talking about an absorbable scaffold, mm -hmm. but there are absorbable polymers, and, and so this can get very confusing for the average person who's, who's not dealing with these stents. Yeah, I, I think at this time, it's this is a first generation bioabsorbable stent. The struts are pretty bulky. Deployment technique needs to be absolutely perfect. And then one thing we do need to remember is it doesn't disappear within a year. There are fragments that may take up to two years or three years to disappear. Those could still be thrombogenic. And it doesn't expand the same way as a metal stent, where you inflate it with a balloon, it stays open. Here it's a stepwise, careful dilatation. So mechanically it's different. And I think that's a very fair point. This yep. is first generation BRS technology compared to what you both have already described as yep. the best in class second generation super outcomes DES that we have. Perhaps moving forward with more data we'll see things change. I think we need to be very, very careful though uh, in our patient selection. And so you know, we're about to have these introduced into our own practice. And I, I think we're going to have to work out who are the patients that are going to be ideal for this and who are the patients that we need to avoid. And obviously there are some yeah. lesion specifics that we may want to uh, avoid, but uh, it may be in that elderly patient or the, that older patient uh, who has lots of other comorbidities and things. You know, it may be that the benefit of having a resorbable stent is not as great as it might be for a, a younger person. I, I don't know how we're going to tease that Where's out. Where's the sweet spot? But I, right. I, I just don't think you suddenly change your practice and start putting BVS in, into everyone. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your very important insights uh, today about new developments in stent technology and stent comparisons. And thank you for joining us on theheart.org on Medscape.